This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. What is Communist Anarchism? By Alexander Berkman. Chapter 1. What do you want out of life? What is it that everyone wants most in life? What do you want most? After all, we are all the same under our skins. Whoever you be, man or woman, rich or poor, aristocrat or tramp, white, yellow, red or black, of whatever land, nationality or religion, we are all alike in feeling cold and hunger, love and hate. We fear disaster and disease and try to keep away from harm and death. What do you want out of life? What do you fear most? That is also true in the main of your neighbor. Learned men have written big books, many of them on sociology, psychology, and many other ologies to tell you what you want. But no two of these books ever agree. And yet I think you know very well without them what you want. They have studied and written and speculated so much about this, for them so difficult a question that you, the individual, have become entirely lost in their philosophies. And they have at last come to the conclusion that you, my friend, don't count at all. What's important, they say, is not you, but the whole, and all the people together. This whole they call society, the commonwealth, the state, and the wiseacres have actually decided that it makes no difference if you, the individual, are miserable as long as society is all right. Somehow they forget to explain how society, or the whole, can be all right if single members of it are wretched. So they go on spinning their philosophic webs and producing thick volumes to find out where you really enter the scheme of things called life and what you really want. But you yourself know very well what you want, and so does your neighbor. You want to be health, well and healthy. You want to be free, to serve no master, to crawl and humiliate yourself before no man. You want to have well-being for yourself, your family, to those near and dear to you, and not to be harassed and worried about the fear of tomorrow. You may feel sure that everyone else wants the same. So whole the matter seems to stand this way. You want health, liberty, and well-being. Everyone is like yourself in this respect. Therefore, we all seek the same thing in life. Then why should we not all seek it together by joint effort, helping each other in it? Why should we rob, cheat, kill, and murder each other if we seek the same thing? Aren't you entitled to the things that you want as well as the next man? Or is it that we can secure our health, liberty, and well-being better by fighting and slaughtering each other? Or is it because there is no other way? Let us look into this. Does it not stand to reason that if we all want the same thing in life, if we have the same aim, that our interests must also be the same? In that case, we should live like brothers in peace and friendship. We should be good to each other and help each other all we can. But you know that it is not that way in life. You know that we do not live like brothers. You know that the world is full of strife and war, of misery, injustice, and wrong, of crime and poverty and oppression. Why is it that way, then? It is because, though we all have the same aim in life, our interests are different. And this is what makes all the trouble in the world. Just think it over yourself. Suppose you want to get a pair of shoes or a hat. You go into the store and try to buy what you need as reasonably and cheaply as you can. That is your interest. But the storekeeper's interest is to sell it to you as dearly as he can, because then his profit will be greater. That is because everything in the life 
that we live is built on making profit one way or another. We live in a system of profit making. Now it is plain that if we have to make profits out of each other, then our interests cannot be the same. They must be different and even often opposed to each other. In every country, you will find people who live by making profit out of others. Those who make the biggest profits are rich. Those who cannot make profits are poor. The only people who cannot make any profits are the workers. You can therefore understand why the interests of the workers cannot be the same as the interests of other people. That is why you will find in every country several classes of people with entirely different interests. Everywhere you will find 1. A comparatively small class of persons who make big profits and who are very rich, such as bankers, great manufacturers, landowners, and people who have much capital and are therefore called capitalists. These people belong to the capitalist class. 2. A class of more or less well-to-do people consisting of businessmen and their agents, real estate men, speculators, and professional men such as doctors, lawyers, inventors, and so on. This is the middle class or the bourgeoisie. 3 great numbers of working men employed in various industries, in mills and mines and factories and shops and transports and on the land. This is the working class, also called the proletariat. The bourgeoisie and the capitalists really belong to the same capitalistic class because they have about the same interests, and therefore the people of the bourgeoisie generally side with the capitalist class against the working class. You will find that the working class is always the poorest class in every country. Maybe you yourself belong to the workers, to the proletariat. Then you know that your wages will never make you rich. Why then are the workers the poorest class? Surely they labor more than any other classes and harder. Is it because the workers are not very important in the life of society? Perhaps we can even do without them. Let us see. What do we need to live? We need food, clothing, shelter, schools for our children, streetcars for travel, and a thousand and one other things. Can you look around and point at a single thing that was made without labor? Why, the shoes you stand in and the streets that you walk on are the result of labor. Without labor, there would be nothing but the bare earth and human life would be entirely impossible. So it means that that labor has created everything we have, all the wealth of the world. It is also the product of a labor applied to the earth and its natural resources. But if that wealth is the product of labor, then why does it not belong to labor? That is, to those who have worked with their hands or with their heads to create it, the manual worker and the brain worker. Everyone agrees that a person has the right to own a thing that he himself has made. But no one person has made or can make anything all by himself. It takes many men of different trade and professions to create something. The carpenter, for instance, cannot make a simple chair or bench all by himself, not even if he should cut down a tree and prepare the lumber by himself. He needs a saw and a hammer, nails and tools, which he cannot make for himself. And even if he should make these for himself, he would first have to supply the raw materials, steel and iron, which other men would have to supply. Or take, for example, let us say, a civil engineer. He could do nothing without paper and pencil and measuring tools, and these things other people have to make for him. Not to mention that first he has to learn his profession and spend many years in study while others enable him to live in the meantime. This applies to every human being in the world today. You can see that no person by his own efforts can make things he needs to exist. In early times, primitive man who lived in a cave 
could hammer a hatchet out of stone or make himself a bow and arrow and live by that. But those days are gone. Today, no man can live by his own work. He must be helped by the labor of others. Therefore, all that we have, all wealth, is the product of labor of many people, even many generations. That is to say, all labor and the products of labor are social and made by society as a whole. But if all wealth we have is social, then it stands to reason that it should belong to society and to the people as a whole. How does it happen, then, that the wealth of the world is owned by some individuals and not the people? Why does it not belong to the people who have toiled to create it, the masses who work with hand or brain, the working class as a whole? You know very well that it is the capitalistic class that owns the greater part of the world's wealth. Must we therefore not conclude that the working people have lost the wealth they have created, or somehow it was taken away from them? They did not lose it, for they never owned it. Then it must be that it was taken away from them. This is beginning to look serious. If you say that the wealth they created has been taken away from them, from the people who created it, then it means that it has been stolen from them, that they have been robbed, for surely no one has ever willingly consented to have his wealth taken away from him. It is a terrible charge, but it is true. The wealth the workers have created, as a class, has been stolen from them, and they are being robbed in the same way every day of their lives, even at this moment. That is why one of the greatest thinkers of French philosophy, Proudhon, said that the possessions of the rich are stolen property. You can readily understand how important it is that every honest man should know about this, and you may be sure that if the workers knew about it, they would not stand for it. Let us see how they are robbed, and by whom. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.